Hey everyone, this is Nick and welcome to your weekly news recap of what happened in the Linux and open source world. So in this one we have a concerning situation in France where it looks like that just using encryption and privacy respecting tool and Linux can lead you to be arrested. We have Windows actually losing users and market share and we have some nice updates to core boot and firmware courtesy of System76. So let's dive in right after this refreshing plunge into this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace and if you want to build your own website but you don't really know where to start and you don't have the technical skills to do it all yourself, then Squarespace is your best option. It's basically your all-in-one platform to start your website. You can design it with their huge template libraries, you can tailor it to your needs thanks to all the customization options, the colors, the various blocks you can place however you want, and you can make it as simple or as complex as you want thanks to all the modules you can add to the website. Whether you need a simple blog, a complete online storefront with online payments, a members only area or a video gallery, they have it all. And to publish your website, Squarespace will also help you pick the domain name. So head over to squarespace.com slash the Linux experiment or simply click the link in the description below and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. So in December 2020, seven people were arrested in France for being suspected of harmful activities. Their trial is being prepared and the grounds on which they've been arrested is basically that they care about privacy and don't want their data collected and that includes using Linux. The French intelligence agency called DGSI pointed out that these people communicated using encrypted apps like Signal and encrypted their hard drives. They also used stuff like ProtonMail, Tor, a VPN, Tails Linux and some de-googled Android ROMs like Slash E, Lineage or even the F-Droid store. And all of this was judged suspicious by the DGSI and this seems to be the only known grounds on which these people have been arrested. They've been asked over and over what they did that necessitated such protections and encryption and if that was to hide illicit activities. The instruction judge even seems to think that this is bad since they use terms like they admitted to using Tails and Tor and they categorized these applications and tools as allowing access to illicit websites. Even though it hasn't been proven in any capacity that these seven people did access illicit websites. They also seem to assume that these people were sort of hackers because they were skilled enough to turn on full disk encryption, which as we all know is a one click operation on any Linux distro install. It's hardly a mark of being highly skilled. They've also been judged suspicious for trying to teach their family how to use the same tools and protections and the judge and authorities continue to demonstrate a complete lack of technical knowledge, mistaking Tor for Tails, thinking you need public Wi-Fi to use Tor, or thinking Tails is an encryption tool. Now, until the trial goes through, we won't know if they actually did anything specific, but the prosecution admitted that for now they failed to come up with any sort of specific harmful activity that these people could have done. So their only crime right now is having used privacy respecting software, which what the hell France? Now, Windows 11 is not very popular. The latest data shows it's actually losing users, dropping from 22.95% of Windows users to 21.11, almost a full 2% drop. As people seem to move back to Windows 10, which still holds almost 72% of the Windows market share, almost two years after Windows 11 was released. And Windows 7 and 8 combined amount to 4.7%. And when your latest and greatest version isn't used by even half of your total users, you need to worry. Especially since Microsoft announced that Windows 10 won't be getting any new features. So you would expect people to start moving to the latest version. But since Windows 11 is basically spyware, as demonstrated in my dedicated video on data collection, and since it doesn't respect user preferences for web browsers, that updates are wacky and regularly cause problems, that a Microsoft account is being forced down your throat, 
and that the start menu actually regressed, it's not super surprising that people are not motivated to move to it. And then there's also the very strict hardware requirements, which can be bypassed, but that might not last for too long either. So yeah, people don't want to use Windows 11, apparently. And of course, a sizable portion of the people still on Windows 10 are probably companies that always take a long while to actually move to a newer version. But Windows 11 should not be losing users. At best or worst, it should be stagnating. And this is a very good opportunity for Linux, because if people don't want to move to Windows 11, and at some point they won't be able to stay on Windows 10, then maybe they'll move to Linux. System76 announced some interesting changes to their open source firmware that they use on their Linux devices. First, they re-disabled the Intel Management Engine, which is a microcontroller that runs its own proprietary micro OS to handle some security features. Since the code of that micro OS isn't open source, System76 chose to disable it, after it had to be re-enabled earlier due to a bug in Coreboot. They also added a new firmware setup menu to let you enable or disable Secure Boot, which is needed to install Windows 11 and dual boot on your computer. For now, it's only for 12th gen Intel CPUs, but they will add it to previous gens as well. They're also working on Pop! OS to enable the use of custom Secure Boot keys and support for TPM2. The firmware also now allows 13th gen Intel CPUs to draw as much as 55 watts of power, when it was previously limited to 28 watts. This means powerful CPUs should run drastically better and give you way more performance, but it shouldn't affect battery life too much, unless your use case is super CPU taxing like gaming or video editing. Their firmware also now supports NVIDIA Dynamic Boost to share power between the CPU and an NVIDIA GPU, providing 25 watts of additional power to the system that needs it the most, so you can expect better performance when gaming, for example. And that's pretty great stuff, because with just a software update, you get better performance, more features, improved reliability, and of course, System76 tried to upstream as much of that work as possible into Coreboot, which is nice. Debian 12 was released today, or will be in a few hours. I'm recording this on Saturday morning, so maybe they moved it, but technically it should release today. Debian 12 is the latest stable release of this venerable distro, and of course I already made a dedicated video about it to show how in the current Linux landscape it makes perfect sense as a desktop. The highlights include an update from GNOME 3.38 to GNOME 43, from KD 5.20 to 5.27, plus 11,000 new packages, the LTS kernel version 6.1, and 67% of all packages in the repos being updated. If you prefer Cinnamon, Mate, LXDE, LXQt, or XFCE, they also have the latest releases available to install. Now, they also added non-free firmware by default. It's not officially part of Debian, so the distro remains completely fast, but if the installer detects that you need this firmware for your peripherals to work, it will automatically enable the non-free firmware repo and install everything it needs, unless you tell it not to. Now, I thought Debian 12 was pretty cool, and although it's still a bit too old for my own personal needs, I think it's definitely the best choice if you want the most stable and well-tested distro you can get your hands on. And with Flatpak, Snaps, or App Images, you can actually get the latest versions of all the apps you need without compromising the stability of the system. So check out my dedicated video in the link in the description below if you want to know more about Debian 12. Now I talked about Vanilla OS recently, which is an immutable distro that uses containers to give you access to virtually 100% of all the available software on Linux. And in the same space, we now have Blend OS 3, at least it's beta. And boy, does it go further in the immutable distro world. First, all system updates now rely on the installation ISOs. When a new ISO would be available for you to make a fresh install, your already installed system will detect it and use that ISO to perform the update instead of applying package updates to the system itself by downloading packages from a repo or by using two partitions, one for the update and one for the current system, like what Vanilla OS does. And if that sounds like it would download a lot of useless data, know that they also use Z-Sync to only download what has changed. 
so it should be fine. On top of that, BlendOS 3 now lets you overlay packages on top of the immutable base, but they install them to a specific layer that can be completely dropped, all packages installed can be completely removed with just one command line, thanks to a new tool called Akshara that can also handle drivers, apparently. BlendOS can install packages from a lot of distributions, including Arch, Alma Linux, Crystal Linux, Debian, Fedora, Kali Linux or Ubuntu, and more. And they even wrote a new tool called Assemble that lets you build packages and images of BlendOS if you want to build a remix of that distro without having to handle your own repository. So BlendOS 3 looks super interesting, with a similar approach to vanilla OS, but with a very different execution. So I'll definitely take a look at it once BlendOS 3 is completely out. Okay, now here is a collection of a few smaller news items. So first, Canonical introduced the ability to stage the release of a snap update, as in, you can deploy that update slowly to a small group of users first, that you then slowly expand to cover all your users. It basically lets you test how well an update works. And if after a few days you're not seeing a ton of bug reports, you can expand the group of users that have access to that update. It's a very interesting feature and pretty important for deploying software to hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of users. And I wish FlatHub started working on that as well. Now still on Ubuntu, 23.10 will add support for quarter screen window tiling on top of the current tiling features that they get from GNOME. They already had planned to add the tiling assistant extension to Ubuntu 23.04, but it just didn't make the cut. And now it looks like it's confirmed for 23.10. Ubuntu developers also said that they would like to work with upstream GNOME to add this in the desktop environment itself in the future. Now, I personally do not have a use case for quarter tiling. It makes windows too small for me to actually be usable, but I know a lot of people like that. So yeah, if they can implement it, it won't hurt me, but it will help a lot of other people. And for GNOME, extension developers can now add a donate button to their extensions. For now, only on the extensions.gnome.org website, but I would be surprised if this wasn't added in other apps like Extension Manager soon. The supported options include Buy Me A Coffee, Ko-fi, Patreon, GitHub, and PayPal. And it's always a nice thing to have a way to reward a developer for something you like, especially with GNOME extensions, which can make or break your workflow. And the first beta for the Supernova release of Thunderbird is now out, with a bunch of new features, design changes, and improvements. I don't think everything they announced for the final Supernova release is baked in just yet. Like the new folder pane in the email view wasn't there for me or not enabled by default at least, but it's a good way to start giving a shot to the new UI if you've been following what they've been working on. I'll spend a little bit more time with that beta to see where they went, what's still left to fix and if I like it. And let's finish this with the gaming news. There's a new update to Proton Experimental, which is the default version of Proton Steam uses for all non-officially supported Steam Play titles. And this new version now finally supports the latest masterpiece. No, not Diablo 4, the Lord of the Rings Gollum, of course. Now it also fixes issues in Call of Duty 2, Secret of Mana and Ubisoft Connect, and it also fixes the menus in Halo the Master Chief Collection. And also, it's not 100% Linux related, but Apple announced at their latest keynote that they were working on a game porting toolkit for developers to bring games to the Mac. And it looks like it's using Wine and VKD3D plus Molten VK, which translates Vulkan instructions into Metal instructions. Metal being the only graphics API Apple wants to support for some reason. Now, it's apparently not as mature as Proton for Linux, since it requires per game bug fixes in Molten VK and performance will probably be a lot worse, since it has to run an x86 binary translated for ARM, which then sends DirectX instructions that are translated into Vulkan instructions, which are then translated into Metal instructions. And of course, with so many translation stabs, it's bound to have a lot more bugs. There are so many more points of failure than with Proton on Linux. But it's still kind of fun to see that Wine which started as a small project 30 years ago to try and run Windows programs on Linux, is now actively being used in a very successful commercial product, the Steam Deck, 
but also by Apple, a company who traditionally never gave a crap about gaming. Now, what you should give a crap about is this segue to our sponsor. If you were wondering what is the best PC or laptop to run Linux on, stop wondering. Just click the link in the description below and head over to Tuxedo's website. They make laptops and desktops that run Linux out of the box. All the components are picked specifically because they are compatible with Linux. You can install any distro or pick from a selection of very popular ones right when you configure your device. And they have laptops and desktops for every price point and every need. Whether you're looking for a small, affordable travel computer, a giant workstation, a gaming laptop, whatever. They have it. There are plenty of customization options and configurations available. And all their laptops are openable, repairable and upgradable, including the SSD, the battery and the RAM and sometimes even the wireless card. So if you need a new computer and you want to make sure that it runs Linux as best as possible, click the link in the description below and get yourself a Tuxedo PC. They're really awesome. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, well, there's always that thumbs down button that you can click. But do tell me why you disliked in the comments. It's just more polite. And if you really enjoyed the video and you want to support the channel, there are plenty of links in the description as well. You know the drill, PayPal, LibraPay, Patreon, YouTube memberships, YouTube thanks. You decide what you want to do, if you want to do anything. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.